So let's look in verse 2. The beast which I saw was like unto a, a leopard. Look at there. He's like unto a leopard. And uh, his feet were as the feet of a bear, right? And his mouth is the mouth of a lion, okay? And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So we look at this and we say, well, this is simply a metaphor because it's not possible that a leopard could be, have like these characteristics of a lion and a bear. That was in the old days, like two years ago, okay? Nowadays, there are creatures that have DNA from multiple other species that we've, we now know how to rewrite and put that stuff in and make whatever creature that we want to. They're releasing genetically modified mosquitoes all throughout Africa. These mosquitoes cannot pass on malaria. But what are we doing? When we genetically modify an entire species of mosquitoes, do we really know the full outcome? We're not smart enough to be God, but we're playing God, right? Man as God never works out, and it won't work out. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Revelation's the end of the Bible. Genesis is the beginning of the Bible. Ecclesiastes tells us the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. So Genesis 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. You have the Godhead there. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the... First thing he said was the fish of the sea. First thing he said, the beast coming up out of the sea. So, do you believe that man has dominion over the fish of the sea? So we can pull fish out and leave them on the bank, or we can eat them, or we can throw them back, or we can do whatever we want, because we have dominion over them. They don't tell us what to do. We have dominion over them. We can eat them, or we cannot eat them. We, do you believe we have dominion over chickens? Praise God, we have dominion over chickens. Amen? Over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In verse 28, God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea. There he said it again, fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And here's my question. In Genesis 1, we clearly have dominion over beasts. But at the end of the Bible, now God has given beasts dominion over man. The dog telling us what to do. Or the cat. Cats especially, amen? Cats are like, get off my couch. <laughs> right? You cat people, you're, on, you're in my living room. Get out. Wag that tail, stare at you like that. That long horn that you got out here, we drove past it, and that thing was looking at us like, this is my tree. <laughs> Keep on moving. The beast, God's going to give the beast dominion over the man. Man had dominion, man's own transgression, man lost that dominion. And now God's going to let the wild beast have dominion over man. God's going to let a beast that has nothing but a terrible demeanor about it to have absolute and total dominion over all of mankind. Uh, Genesis 9, the same thing. The fear of you and dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea and your hand are they delivered. Now turn to Job 41 because in Job we're actually given God's own description of what a beast out of the sea would be like. Job 41, turn there in your Bibles because I may read more verses than what's up on the screen. Job 41, verse 1. I like Job 40 and 41 because they talk about dinosaurs, and I like dinosaurs. You turn me loose on library day, and that's the first thing I went looking for was brand new dinosaur books in the library. Okay, I believe in them, and I believe that God created leviathans and behemoths on the same day that he created man. Amen? That's good. 
See, I believe man walked with dinosaur. Dinosaur walked with man. They did not come 65 million years earlier because there wasn't no 65 million years to be earlier. It just wasn't that way. Canst thou draw out Leviathan? We have two, we have two beasts in Job 40 and 41. Job 40, we have Behemoth. Behemoth is not a hippopotamus. It's not. Even though the marginal note in some of your Bibles say, mine, my Bible says hippopotamus. The behemoth has a tail like a cedar. Hippopotamus got a little bit of a little, 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 little wiggly deal. Like a straw, not a cedar, amen? So this was not a hippopotamus, was not an elephant. It was not an alligator. This was a huge large behemoth of a creature that could draw up the entire Jordan River with one drink. And notice that he said, verse 15 of chapter 40, Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. Day 6, God made all of the beasts of the earth and man on the exact same day. They did not come 65 million years before us. Same day they were created. Now look at Leviathan. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? All of these answers to these questions are no. That's the answer to this question. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Can you throw in a 65-pound test line and catch a Leviathan with it? No. You'll never reel him in. He's huge. Or his tongue with a cord which thou let us down? No. Canst thou put a hook into his nose? No. Or bore his jaw through with a thorn? No. Will he make many supplications unto thee? In other words, can you teach a Leviathan to beg for food? No. Will he speak soft words unto thee? No. In fact, soft words are the opposite of the beast in Revelation 13 who speaks great things and blasphemy. So he's not going to speak nice. Will he make a covenant with thee? No. Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Can you make a Leviathan do your tricks? Can you make a Leviathan plow your field like you could teach a mule to plow your field, but you can't do that with a Leviathan. You can't train him. That you, not make, you will not make a Leviathan your servant. You are going to be his. So look at verse 5. Would thou play with him as with a bird? No. Or would thou bind him for thy maidens? No. Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Does anybody eat Leviathan? No. He's at the top of the food chain. Nothing eats Leviathan. He eats and consumes everything. This is the beast of Revelation 13. So then he says, shall they part him among the merchants? Has he ever been caught and sold in the market? No, not even in Japan. And they eat all kinds of junk from the sea. Verse 7, canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? No. Now look at verse 8. Verse 8 is my favorite verse in this chapter. Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. That means if you ever decide that you were going to try to fight and catch one, if you lived through it, you would swear that you would never do that again. Amen? Now look at the next verse. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up then look at the last part of verse 10. Who then is able to stand before me? God didn't say, who then is able to stand before him? He said, who then is able to stand before me? God said, you think he's fierce? I made him. I made him. Okay? God uses the Viathan to teach us that we are made a little lower than the angels. And there are things that can conquer us. In fact, I'm going to throw something else at you too. 
Go back to Revelation 13. When I read this, it scared me, Brother John. It scared me. Are we not the victorious saints? Are we not the saints of the living God? In Revelation chapter 13, I want you to notice that verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. What's the next part say? And to overcome them. That scared me. Because I thought we win every battle, right? Has God ever let something overcome you in your life? He has with me. God let things overcome me and beat me. Number one, because I was too high and mighty. I was too good. I was too self-righteous. And I was too proud. And so God let a Leviathan beast overcome me and beat me and overwhelm me. And God, through that, showed me that I wasn't as good as I made everybody think I was. And number two, I wasn't as strong as I thought I was. And God used that to teach me that I'm just going to have to rely on him the rest of my life or I wasn't going to make it. It's a good lesson for us to learn, is it not? Because we get too high and mighty. We get too self-righteous. We get too, because, oh, we believe the King James Bible. And our church is better than that church down here where they drink from the vine of Sodom. And they welcome everybody and they don't judge anybody. Our church is better than they are. Maybe because of what you believe, yes. But you got, you're made out of the same dirt that they are. And God doesn't want you to ever forget it. Amen? All right, let's move on. Daniel chapter, we already did that. Job 41, we already did that. We already did that. Uh, let's see. Let's move on here. Let me show you this. You ever seen anything like this? What are they? Huh? Dragons? Leviathans? So I'm gonna, I mean, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe that there were Leviathans in the sea? In fact, Job 41, if you go back and read it, God was describing dragons in the sea that fire came out of their nostrils and that they were, their mouth was so hot that when they floated under the sea, you could follow their trail because up from them came bubbles like a hoarfrost from the fire and the steam that was coming out of their mouth. Now, God doesn't lie. God does not make up fairy tales and myths to tell it. God does not lie to tell us the truth. If God said that these creatures, Job, do you know Leviathan? Job says, I know Leviathan. If God said that, that means that those creatures lived in the seas at one time. And that's what I believe. I believe the Bible. Did you know that your King James Bible actually has the word Sea monsters in it. You ever read that? You ever read that? Remember that one? Turn to Lamentations. In fact, take a look at this. Take a look at this. This is a sea monster. See my little red dot there? See it floating around? Okay. It's got people on it. And this sea monster has, of course, it has a tail. It's got, it's got uh, scales on it. And take a look here. You know what those are? They're breasts. Lamentations 4, 3, even the sea monsters draw out the breast. Now, I am not aware of any sea creature in the ocean right now that feeds its young with its milk from breasts. I'm not aware of any. Maybe I don't know everything. But I know the Bible was right when it describes sea monsters that draw out the breast 
because whoever drew this picture saw them. See, your Bible, when it tells you these things, you can and should believe what your Bible's telling you. Amen? So if the Bible said that these things existed at one time, and we don't believe that, if we can't believe the Bible's telling the truth about the past, how can we then believe the Bible's telling the truth about what hasn't even happened yet? So if we're going to believe the Bible for telling the truth about what hasn't happened yet, why don't we believe the Bible when it tells us of things that has already happened? Like sea monsters that draw out the breast. Okay? Now, let's take a look at the symbolism of the sea. Turn to Exodus 15. We're going to look at the sea. We're going to look at why he comes out of the sea. What does it mean when it means he comes out of the sea? Does it literally mean... The body of water, of salt. So yes, I believe that. I believe it means exactly that. But is there, as with many things in the Bible, does it actually mean something deeper? Does it have a deeper significance to it? Does it have a symbolism to it whereby the Bible then is going to explain the symbolism? Yes. 15.1, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for we have triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So the beast is going to come out of the sea. Why is he there? God threw him in there. Okay, that's what I think this is telling us. I think the Bible's telling us that he's there because God put him there. Put him in the sea. So what does the Bible mean when it talks about the sea? Isaiah 57, 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea. He's actually making a comparison. Here we have the sea and we have the wicked. Can you think of a story in the Bible where there was a troubled sea? First one that says it. I'll... Huh? Huh? Jonah, very good. And when Jonah was in the whale's belly in Jonah chapter 2, where did he say that he was? Huh? Belly of hell. He said he was in the belly of hell. He was actually equating this sea monster, this whale, with hell. Okay? Give me another story where there's a troubled sea. There you go. Okay? So are we not like Peter, James, and John? Are we not, if the wicked are like the troubled sea, are we not like they in a troubled sea right now? Are we not surrounded by the wicked? Especially when we go to Walmart. We were in there and Caleb was going, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I see it, son. I can't believe it, but I see it. Are we not surrounded by the wicked? Are we not surrounded by wicked churches? So there are no Muslim mosques in Laclede County, are there? There are no Buddhist temples? No. But you've got paganism, you've got idol worship, you've got wicked religious practitioners all around you, and you don't have a Buddhist temple anywhere. You don't have a Muslim mosque, but you are surrounded by the wicked. So right now, we are like the disciples in the troubled sea. We're surrounded by the wicked, and it bothers us. Because we're having to raise our children and our grandchildren. And it scares me to death. I have ten grandchildren, one's in heaven. And I don't like the world that my grandchildren are growing up in. I'm keeping them very, very close. Very close. So our Lord comes to us and says, peace, be still. Amen? Jeremiah 6.22 
Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country. We talked about that earlier. <laughs> and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea. So now we're talking about, number one, we're talking about the wicked. Number two, now we're talking about an army, a nation. And it's not a nation from this earth. It's a nation from what the Bible calls the north. The north is a direction that, from what I can see, points in the direction of the spiritual realm. The north country. The Joel, Joel's army from Joel comes from the north. He calls it the northern army. So that army, their voice roareth like the sea. So think of their voice. They ride upon horses, set in array as men, of, men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. Jeremiah 50, verse 41. Behold, a people shall come from the north. There it is again. And a great nation. And many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice, again, here it is, the second witness. Their voice shall roar like the sea. And they shall ride upon horses. I want to ask you a question. What army in this world now actually still rides on horses? There isn't one. I mean, we still have the 51st Cavalry, the American Army, but none of those ride on horses. They ride Jeeps and tanks and Hummers and everything else. They don't ride, we don't ride horses in battle anymore, but this army does. Now, is that just because Jeremiah didn't know what a tank looked like? No. He was seeing what God was telling him was coming. And I promise you, this army's coming on horses. But they're not from this world. Okay? In Revelation chapter 6, we have four men that show up at the opening of the seals. And what are they on? They're on horses. These are spirits. Because Zechariah tells us that these are spirits. Okay? So... This nation that comes is a nation of spirits, not good ones either. Their voice shall roar like the sea. Ezekiel 26, 3, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee as the sea causeth his waves to come up. Now he says many nations. He's, so the Bible is saying, Here are many nations, and they are as the sea. What does that mean? Genesis 1, chapter 9. In fact, turn to Genesis 1. I want you to see something in your Bible. I want you to look at it in your Bible. Make a note. Underline this in your Bible. Genesis 1, 9. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together under one place and let the dry land appear. So, on day two of creation, there was all the water covering all the earth and there was no dry land. So what God did was God put the water over here and he put the dry land over here. It's the first time he did that. That was day two of creation. Notice verse 10. God called the dry land earth. Then the gathering together of the waters called he what? Seas. Okay. So, and I, this is important and I'm setting something for you. Okay? We're trying to understand the sea that the beast is coming from. So he says that the gathering together of the waters is seas. This is important. Habakkuk 3.15, thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. So there it is again. Great waters is the sea and the sea is the gathering together of the waters. Again, it'll make sense in a minute. Revelation 17, turn there, because this is going to be our answer right here. Revelation 17. Where, and this is answering the question, where is the beast going to come from? Who's got to go to work at four in the morning? Caleb, I'm going to remember you said that. 
because the outside of the trailer needs to be washed. Four in the morning, bro. Revelation 17, are you there? Say amen. We had a pastor from India come and preach at our church. I loved him, King James Bible preacher. And he said, I like to hear when pages turning in your Bible, it gives the devil a headache. So let's give him a migraine, amen. Revelation 17, 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great horde that sitteth where? Upon many waters. What did we say the many waters were? What did God call it? The sea. Okay, now look at verse 15. The Bible tells you what these waters are. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are what? Peoples. And multitudes and nations and tongues. Where's this beast coming from, people? The world. People. Humans. Meaning that he's in every one of us. Is he not? Do you not have something in you that as a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, you hate? And it's a part of you that you cannot make it do what it doesn't want to do, and you can't stop it from doing what it wants to do. A part of you that you hate, a part of you that does things that you don't want to do, and it doesn't do things that you want to do. Does that make sense to you? Because I'm quoting Bible here. Okay? There's a little beast in every one of us. It's a part of our flesh that should be killed every day. Crucified. Destroyed. I am crucified daily, okay? Take up thy cross daily, Jesus said, and follow me. Why? Because there's something in us that needs to be killed every day. And it does things that we don't want done, and it doesn't do things that we want to do. Like when you want to pray and you can't. Or when you know you need to read your Bible and you don't. And there's something in you saying, don't read it, don't read it, don't read it. You ever had, is that just me? Is that you, preacher? Is that you? It is you. He's, in fact, I'll tell you who he is. Turn to Romans 7. Romans 7. See, the beast, the sea, is the waters. The waters are the people Multitudes, nations, and tongues. It's humanity. It's, it's us. There's something in us. And here's what Paul called it. Romans 7, verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What was one of the other names of the beast? The man of... See? He's in there. He's in there. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, Paul was very distinct on separating the two Pauls. The Paul that wants to serve God and pray and labor in the scripture and preach and make disciples and do good and never sin. And then there's the Paul that won't let him do any of that. So Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's what it's called. There's, noth there's a part of you that is absolutely no good. Now, that church down here that doesn't judge anybody, they'll never tell you that. Because you can have your best life now. Right? Right? But this Bible will tell you different. There's something in every good church member, every Bible believer, that keeps them from doing what they want to do, keeps them from doing what's right, 
that does things that you don't want it to do, but it's not you anymore that's doing it. It is no good thing that dwelleth in you. It is sin that dwelleth in you. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, Paul said, I find not. It's in our seed. Because John passed it down to Jessica. Poor Jessica. And Jessica passed it down to her. What's your name? Tony? Poor thing. You're just like your grandpa, aren't you? Right? That's why she was born a sinner, and she was born a sinner, and he was born a sinner, and his mama, she was a great lady, she was born a sinner, and her and mom and daddy were born sinners. And it came all the way from who? Eve. That's how it got in there. Turn to Genesis 3. That's how it got in there. It was seated in her. Okay? Now, let me go back to this. You've heard me talk about DNA, right? DNA is in the cells of your body. It is a book of every member of your body. It is the instruction manual on how to put the barbecue grill together, right? Every barbecue grill has an instruction manual on how to put it together. Your DNA is the instruction manual on how to make every member of your body, your hands, your eyes, your hair, your skin, uh, my aching feet, every part of your body, the DNA makes those members, okay? And your DNA is in all your cells, and in all your cells, you have 46 packages of DNA. Think of it like, like your refrigerator has 46 Tupperware dishes, which is probably not too far from being true, right? There's 46 bowls of stuff in your refrigerator. You have no idea what they do anymore, but they're in there. So every cell in your body has 46 containers called chromosomes, and that's where all, your, that's where all the books of your genes are stored, okay? When the, when the devil spoke to Eve in Genesis 3, I counted those words, starting out with, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Going down, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day ye, that then your eyes shall be open, ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. That's 46 words. Now, if you think that doesn't mean something, I want you to open your Bible, turn to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, come on. Give the devil a headache here. Turn to Genesis 2. I want to show you, I want to show you how right this... I mean, your church says, authorized 1611 King James Bible. Do you mean it? Oh, it's close. Genesis 2. I want to show you something cool. Because... I had 23 chromosomes. My wife had 23 chromosomes. When we conceived our first child, she received 23 from my wife and 23 from me. That gave her 46. And that's how it works. With every child conceived in the world, they get 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad. And they're joined together. That gives each child 46 chromosomes. And that's the package of all their DNA together. Now I'm going to show you something neat from your King James Bible. In Genesis 2, look at verse 23. Isn't that interesting? Verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones. Who wants to count all these words? You want me to do it for you? I already did. There's 46 words here, and I want you to read those words. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. You see, Genesis 2, verses 23 and 24, tell you how little babies are made. The man and the woman cleave together, and they literally become one flesh, one child. 46 words here in your King James Bible. And the child is 23 from dad and 23 from mom together to make the 46 chromosome. Your Bible's right. Numerically, it's right. So, back to Genesis 3. When the devil spoke these words, he seeded something. 
Turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Does your feet hurt sitting down there? Mine are killing me. Genesis, or Matthew 13. You actually have a story illustrating this in your Bible. Matthew 13. Verse 24. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now we know the parable, right? So who's the man? It's God. What is the good seed? It's the word of God, right? When God made Adam in the Garden of Eden, that was the good seed. Adam was called in Luke 3 the son of God. Right? God made Adam in his image and in his likeness, meaning that he was, in that sense, the son of God. That's who Adam was. So that's the good seed. But then, look at the next verse. But while men slept, his enemy. Who's his enemy? Satan. What did he do? He came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And right now... The tares look just like the wheat, and you can't tell the difference until when? Okay, harvest. What happens at harvest? With apple trees, what happens at harvest? What happens to an apple when it's ready? How do we know it's ready for harvest? Huh? Before that. An apple's green and hard on a tree, but when it's ready for harvest, it changes. It changes color, softens. That's how we know it's ripe. Peaches? Peaches are green as grass and hard as a rock on the tree until the harvest. At harvest, they change. Right? Wheat is green as grass. Until harvest. And what, is, what happens? How do we know it's harvest? It changes. Transforms. When is harvest with us? Right now, we're just green as grass. But then, we're going to transform. We're going to change, John. Amen? That's what, that's what happens at harvest. Is it's going to be a transformation. With us, we're going to be transformed into the image of God's dear Son, Jesus Christ. Okay? What happens with the rest of the world? They're going to change as well. They're going to be born again, but not of corruptible, incorruptible seed. They're going to be born again of corruptible seed. And what was the corruptible seed? It's right there in Genesis 3. The devil seeded. He planted. What are we made of? Dirt of the earth, the ground. When God puts his word in us, he's sowing seed. Just like you would put a seed in the earth. We're of the earth and God put a seed in us because we're made of dirt. What did the devil do? He put his seed also. The same place God put his good seed. And they're growing together. Because this is where he put it. He put it in us. The peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues are the sea that the beast is going to rise out of. He's in us right now. There is, and I have a ton of information on this, and I don't have it ready for right now. You know what? I want to move through some of this and I want to kind of set you up for tomorrow night. Can we do that? Let's look at the seven heads very quickly. Revelation 13, turn back there. Now, the good thing is we're recording this 
And so if you are lost, I don't mean lost like you're going to hell lost, but if I'm kind of going over your head, here's what you can do. A lot of this stuff I've taught in other lessons. So what you can do is go to Sermon Audio and watch all 2,500 sermons I have on there and catch up. And then you can go and watch these, all right? No, I'm trying to... I'm trying to, I'm trying to Bring enough scripture together so that we understand at least as much as we can who this beast is, what he is, what he's doing, what he's going to do, where he's coming from, and how we can recognize him. Because if we go back to 2 Thessalonians, if we believe that the falling way happens first before our gathering. That also means the man of sin is going to be revealed. And to the world, he's God. Because he makes everybody think he's God. But they're wrong, aren't they? But they don't know that. So they're going to look at him. They're going to say he's God. Who is going to be in this world that's going to say, no, he's not? That's up to us. We're going to know what the Bible says, and we're going to say, that's not Jesus. And that is not God. Okay? We're going to know the truth, and the truth will make us free. Amen? So Revelation 13. Stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads. What does the number seven stand for? In Revelation 17, 9, and here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. So it's now the Bible's telling you that, yes, there are heads, but they also represent mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. So now we get this clue here. The beast's seven heads, they represent seven mountains, and they represent seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So what are these seven heads? What are these seven mountains? What are these seven kings? What do they represent? By the way, think about this. I mean, you do well enough in a day just having one head. And are there not times when you're going, I don't know what to do here, right? I mean, you go to McDonald's, you're sitting there in the drive-thru, and you're going, honey, what do I want? Do I, do I want... No, I had that yesterday. What do I? We can't make up our mind and we've only got one. This beast has seven. You know what that is? Can you imagine one body having seven heads on it? Which head decides what directions the legs are going to go? What head decides what it's going to eat? What head decides the direction it's going or whatever? What head, out of seven heads, which one's in charge? Because they're all going to be fighting one another. Who in here has three or four or five or six or seven kids? Do they all get along? No. And I'm being serious. Think of a beast with seven heads. You know what he is? He's a nation divided against his own self. And a nation divided against itself, what happens to it? It will not stand. We're the body of Christ. How many heads do we have? One head. Can you imagine a church like this church having seven pastors? Seven pastors. If I were to get seven of my closest pastor friends, and John's one of them, there's no way in the world we'd agree on everything, right? So in a church, in a body, there can only be one head. This beast has seven heads. That's not good. It's not going to stand, all right? Uh, Revelation 4, think of this. It's the opposite of... The seven spirits of God. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings of voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So if the beast is the opposite of Christ, Christ 
according to Revelation 5 and Isaiah 11, Christ has the seven spirits of God. The Antichrist then does not have the seven spirits of God. He has seven heads. He has seven kings. All right? And they're like seven different spirits. Was there somebody in the Bible that had seven devils in them? Deuteronomy 7. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and Jebusites. And if you want to count those, you can, but the Bible says there's seven. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. That's what was in the promised land that possessed the land that Israel was going to go in and possess it, and God was going to kick them out. Those seven nations are a picture of those seven heads and those seven kings and those seven mountains. Mountains are like kingdoms in the Bible. All right? So these seven nations are like the seven heads of the beast. They are, and they are to be conquered. In Matthew 15, we have seven things, look at this, that proceed out of the heart of man that defiles him. Can you be defiled by what goes into the body? No. You are defiled by what comes out of the body. Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Now, just asking in a general sense, who has these in them? I do. Remember, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Seven things. I have evil thoughts. You're not going to get to know what they are. Have I ever thought about murdering somebody? Lately? Adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. We have those in us. And we don't want them to come out, do we? No. But they're in us. Those are seven things, like the seven heads. Then we have Mary Magdalene. When Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. She had that in her. In Luke 11, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with this, because I'm just, I'm just, I didn't sleep last night. So I'm tired. Luke 11, 24. Turn your Bibles there and we'll close. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse, worse than the first. John, have you ever seen somebody that was a real wicked sinner and they came to church and they bowed at the altar and you prayed with them and they were in here for a few months and then they left and they got worse that time than they ever were before. Has anybody ever seen that before? Been in church long enough, you've seen it. That's that right there. That's what that is. Those seven devils that Mary Magdalene had had they come back on her, they would have made her worse than she ever was. Fortunately, we don't, think she, we don't think that happened. We think she's in heaven now. She was a witness of the resurrection. But those seven devils, those seven unclean spirits, those seven kings of those seven nations in Canaan land, they're all pictures, photographs, symbols, stories that tell you what's, what the nature of the beast and why he has seven heads with him. It is the exact opposite of the seven spirits of God. You want to study Isaiah 11, those are the, that's where the seven spirits are. And all you have to do is look at what the opposite of each one of those is and you'll figure out who that beast is. You'll figure him out. You'll know his nature and his character. People ask me, Pastor Mike, do you think Barack Obama is the beast? And I said, no. And they said, 
Why? I said, because he doesn't have seven heads. Hillary, maybe. Maybe she's hiding them. I don't know, but no. But anyway, I'm tired and you're tired and I won't get into all this. We'll, we'll pick this up tomorrow. Maybe I'll add some things to it, all right? Any questions? Anything I said that you're going, Otter nuts, dear. Okay? Take everything I said, pray about it, think about it, make notes, go to your Bible. And then on the day when the beast is revealed, we'll remember that God taught us these things and we'll go, that is not Jesus. Amen? Pastor John, come on.